Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are going to start the Symposium 16 now. It's on trauma, the Symposium 3. Uh, basically, it's on pediatric trauma, chest trauma, and neurotrauma, spinal cord injuries. And uh, uh, I'm going to introduce this. First speaker for this uh, for this session uh, is going to speak on recent developments in pediatric trauma. It's done by Professor Robin W. Patton, uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon, uh, East Lancashire Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust, uh, United Kingdom. Good day. It's a great honour for me to be asked to speak at the Sri Lankan Surgical Congress, particularly on your Golden Jubilee. I am going to be speaking about recent developments in pediatric trauma in the UK. The agenda is uh, to talk about virtual fracture clinics and fracture management, uh, the getting it right first time in the UK, the development of trauma centers and networks, and current research. Virtual fracture clinics have been developed in the UK in the last two to three years. It became a necessity, particularly in the summer months, because of the number of cases turning in the emergency uh, outpatient department following referral from the accident and emergency. This is mainly uh, due to low energy trauma. This resulted in huge clinics, uh, which resulted in long waits for patients and it was not totally satisfactory. Therefore, these clinics were set up to try and improve the system and has resulted in 45% of cases being discharged from the accident emergency without having to go to the fracture clinic. It can only work if guidelines are kept to, and guidelines have to be very thorough and discussed with the emergency department and accident and emergency with very clear uh, pathways on what should be done for each fracture. This takes quite a lot of time, it is worthwhile. We also look at the national guidelines from the British Orthopaedic Association, the British Society for Children's Orthopaedic Surgery, and nationally, the NICE guidelines uh, to look at best practice. It has to have very close liaison with the emergency department to make the system work. And this means that everyone has to buy in from the most junior doctor to the consultants. And if the system isn't working, senior consultants from the trauma and orthopedics and the emergency departments have to sit down to make it work. What happens is that all the records and images are looked at by a pediatric orthopedic consultant and a nurse, and the decision is made. They can be discharged, they can be followed up in the consultant clinic, or through advanced nurse practitioners or physiotherapy where necessary. The plaster removal and wound care can be undertaken by the nursing side. And this is just a little algorithm to see what happens. The emergency department, the A&E, uh, look at the patient. They can discharge them straight away or send them to the virtual fracture clinic who can discharge it or send it to one of their outpatients. So uh, remodeling in children has always been our, our, our savior. And it's amazing that over the last 20, 30 years, much more aggressive treatment has been undertaken on children's fractures, when in fact we know the majority will probably remodel. Uh, the best remodeling, of course, is the distal forearm, the wrist fracture, and the proximal humerus, particularly under 10 years of age. And it is surprising that over 60 degrees can remodel in under 10 years, but over 10 years, up to 25 degrees with proximal humerus fractures, making internal fixation unnecessary. Um, the areas which are least likely to remodel, of course, are the mid-shaft of the forearm and the tibia. But in young children with femoral fractures, remodeling of over 30 degrees can occur, which allows us to use more conservative treatments. If we look at fixation over the last few years, you can see as the child comes more mobile, more active, more involved in sport and other dangerous activities, such as motorcycling or pedal cycling, the fractures get more extensive. In the infant, it's usually uh, the fractures we worry about are around the elbow, a proximal femur, particularly if there might be non-accidental injury, um, and they need to be closely looked at because of the long-term effects if treated badly. Uh, in the adolescent, of course, they are doing far more dangerous activities and they often have multiple injuries or severe fractures of the pelvis or femur. Uh, most children have lower energy injuries around the wrist and ankle. Getting right first time is a development from uh, Professor Briggs uh, from the British Orthopaedic Association. 
because it was clear that a lot of cases were being treated very differently in different regions of the UK. Some very aggressively with fixation and open reduction, and others conservatively. It was therefore decided this wasn't best for patients, as it could result in um, unwarranted treatment and complications such as infection or long-term damage. So the way this works is that best practice is shared, uh, the variations are looked at, and uh, the best practice in all the literature is, is reviewed, if, we're, if this is possible. Once variations which are, seem to be unacceptable are identified, this is discussed with the unit, and then that unit has to, do, to do deliver the changes. And, and this is all for the improvement of children. An example would be in Nottingham, where forearm manipulation was taken down to the accident and emergency department, where internasal analgesia and internox gas was used uh, to, uh, while manipulating the fracture, which was done by a middle grade doctor. And the plaster uh, was applied in the, the accident and emergency department. They were then discharged to fracture clinic. Now this prevented them having to be admitted as inpatients or having to wait often hours uh, fasted to get a slot into theatre. The results, when looked at in audits, were as good as a manipulation under anaesthetic. But there was huge resistance in the emergency department initially uh, before this could be uh, started. But it's now uh, accepted as the, the proper and best treatment in that area. Another example uh, was with upper limb fractures, where uh, we know that elbow fractures, particularly lateral condylar mass fractures or supracondylar fractures, can have very high complication rates and litigation rates in the UK. But by using uh, virtual fracture clinics and looking at best practice uh, and reviewing and auditing the results, standards could be maintained, reducing the amount of complication. Another example was with an adolescence where there was a trend to open reduction and internal fixation of a forearm fractures. This is a big procedure with a lot of soft tissue scarring and also a lot of damage and, and, and potential damage to vessels and nerves. Whereas most of these fractures for uh, the growth plates have fused can be treated with elastic stable intermodality nails, such as the Nancy nails, which have very small scars and are, have much less pain and swelling post surgical. Another example has been the change in femoral fractures. Tradition in Britain, most femoral fractures were treated by traction. Uh, but now, under the age of six, uh, most children are given a hip spiker and a manipulation on anesthetic. And because, as we showed earlier, a lot of the uh, uh, angular deformity can remodel in a young age, uh, this allows them to go home within 48 hours. There has been a, an increasing trend with the uh, elastic stable intermodality nail um, for those under the age of uh, younger ages, probably usually between 6 and 10, and of a weight of less than 50 kilograms. Straction is still used in some areas, but is, is, is losing uh, its... Um, use, uh, mainly because we don't want children to be inpatients for a long time, um, and external fixators are very rarely required, really only in, in compound fractures. The, the changes which came from GERFT is to su uh, tell or suggest that in the uh, accident and emergency they should be given analgesia and a femoral nerve block for pain relief. In tibial fractures, not surprisingly, most can still be treated by manipulation and anaesthetic and a plastic cast, uh, though there has been a trend to uh, uh, elastic stable intermodality nails. However, uh, this is a difficult uh, operation because of triangular shape. External fixators are usually only used for compound fractures. We were talking about the infant earlier and, and how we really need to do surgery on them, but we also have to be careful that in this age group that non-accidental injuries are more common and they can have devastating effects if not picked up as the child may even lose their lives. And so, therefore, in the virtual fracture clinic, you have to pick up corner fractures, rib fractures, particularly long bone fractures in the femur and child who's not weight-bearing, as they can all be inflicted by relatives, friends, or other people. So what's happened with the networks? Well, it was realized that uh, not every hospital could do everything, and therefore a hub-and-spoke system of major trauma centers and major trauma units have been set up. And this has been rolled out throughout the UK. In England, there are five dedicated major trauma centers uh, for children's fractures and 11 children and adults major trauma centers. However, in the northwest of England, which is a population of about 10 million people, um, there are only two major trauma centers and 16 major trauma units. Now, trauma units 
are usually in the hospitals of a population of between a quarter of a million and half a million people. But some local emergency hospitals still have to have some ability to deal with significant trauma, such in, in isolated areas, such as the Lake District, where climbing and other injuries may occur. So what happens when someone gets injured? There's an ATLS assessment by the ambulance service, and if there's major airway of, of, of bleeding problems, or if there's a significant head injury or respiratory uh, problems, they go straight to the major trauma center. Uh, or if it's not possible, there's an isolated area, a major trauma unit. Uh, the major trauma centers usually have all the facilities such as plastic surgery, neurosurgery, thoracic surgery, general surgery, and all and major trauma units may have major orthopedic and general surgical centers, but may not have the plastic southern research. Also, uh, where there's uh, complex injuries uh, involving not just the bones, but such as uh, chest injuries, abdominal injuries, multiple bone injuries, or ischemic injuries, would tend to go to the major trauma center. There are also advice areas for uh, areas where there's been a death in the same compartment or a, someone is entrapped in a vehicle where a trauma cell can give it advice from a senior consultant of which sort of hospital we should go to. Talk about research. Uh, traditionally, there hasn't been a lot of research in, in children's orthopedics and very little in the way of children's uh, trauma surgery. There's been a drive from the National Institute of Health Research in the UK to change this. And instead of just doing case histories or observational studies, there have been randomized controls trials. Um, this is looked upon as an important area uh, for outcomes. And the outcomes which are used uh, in these research projects are patient-related outcome measures, the EQ5DY, which is a functional score, and a pain score. This is one of the such studies. It's CRAFT. Uh, it's run out of Oxford by the National Institute for Health Research. And this is the, the typical distal uh, forearm fracture, which traditionally we would manipulate or even put wires into. Uh, we know that they can be modeled up to 40 degrees. And therefore, this study is a randomized controlled study in which uh, one arm, the child is not treated at all other than in putting a cast and allowed to remodel. And the other arm is traditional treatment, such as manipulation under anesthetic or internal fixation. And this is uh, progressing quite well at the moment, uh, but it will take several years to see the results. Another example is the medial epicondyle fracture, uh, which traditionally can be treated both conservatively or operatively fixation. And nobody knows what the, the, the best method is. Uh, so therefore, this is a randomized controlled trial where one uh, group is just treated in, in, in a cast or a splint, and the other one is treated by open reduction to fixation. And this has been progressing over the last two years and is recruiting quite a, a number of people and hopefully will be able to give us a definitive answer. Other research projects are uh, projects into the torus fracture, the stable fracture with, uh, of the distal radius, in which has been put into two arms. And another project which has started, which is called Odd, Odd Socks, is a, a distal uh, tibial sort of Harris II fracture, in which, I, like the craft study, uh, it's not being manipulated, but being allowed to remodel and assess this against uh, conventional treatment. This is quite exciting, and I think it's putting children's orthopedic trauma care at the forefront of research in orthopedics. And it's very well organized from the center where all the consents and data analysis is undertaken. And the principal investigators just need to put the data in a very easy uh, red cut cap system. And it's very helpful easy to do and is multi-center and I think it's a way forward for children's trauma research. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I hope it's been uh, of value. Um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Sir Lankin uh, Surgical Group for their Congress and I hope that your uh, Golden Jubilee is successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Patan. And, uh, Thank for your informative presentation on the recent developments in pediatric trauma. Uh, the next presentation is by Dr. Sunil Vijay Singh, huh? a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon at the uh, Lady Ridge Hospital for Children. And he's going to talk to us on why pediatric fractures are unique. Over to Dr. Vijay Singh. 
At the outset, I would like to thank the President and the Council of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka for giving me this opportunity to talk on this uh, important topic. Why pediatric fractures are unique? In fact, it is unique and it is different to fractures that you see in adults. And child is not an adult and child is not a miniature adult as well. And then there is a difference. And that difference is causing various unique factor patterns in children. And children fractures, these differences are mainly due to the growth. And growth you see only in children, not in adults. And this growth is happen in children's bone. And then these children's bone have different biomechanical characteristics. Basically, pediatric fractures have great osteogenic potential. They heal very quickly and they have increased remodeling capacity, even with a, it is a minor angulation will correct on its own, leading to giving rise to normal bone after some time. So those are the two main uh, uh, unique features that pediatric fractures have. What are the growth modifications that you see in children? They grow in length this way, and it is due to endochondral ossification and then grow, they grow in width this way, and that is due to intramembrane ossification. This growth in length and width is again seen only in children and not in adults. What is the basic process of normal bone remodeling? It is initially it's a new bone, which is weak, but large in quantity, converts into mature bone, which is strong and small in quality. And that is what happens in bone remodeling in children. Another fact is that in child's law, the, the long bone in a child has different areas which you don't see in adults. Example, the, the yellow area that you see here is physis. We call it physis or physial plate. And the next area adjacent to the yellow area, the physial plate is metaphysis. And the central area of the long bone is called diaphysis. You see these areas only in children's fractures, and because of these areas, we see different types of fractures in children. Uh, out, of, uh, the, uh, the, out of this area, the physis is the weakest, then comes the metaphysis, and then finally the strongest part is the diaphysis. We'll now move on to unique fracture patterns you see in children. Basically, we see five unique fracture patterns in children. We'll start one by one. The first one is the physial ligament. You see physis only in, on, only in children, mainly childhood fractures in all physis, which is it comprises 20% of all skeletal injuries in children. And unfortunately, when there's a physial injury, it can disrupt growth of the bone. And a person called Salter Harris has classified these physial injuries, and it has, he has classified this into uh, five grades. Higher grade fractures are more likely to cause growth disturbances. So this is salt Harris type 1, which fracture passes transversely through the physis, separating physis from the metaphysis. Salt Harris type through 2, transversely through the physis, but exit through the metaphysis with a triangular fragment. So salt Harris type 3 is a process of the physis and exit through the epiphysis at the joint space. Salt Harris type 4, fracture extends upward from the joint line through the physis and out to the metaphysis. And the type 5 is a crush injury to the growth plate and which is which, which invariably leads to growth arrest. So out of these salt Harris five types, the most common type is salt Harris type two, and then which is followed by one, three, four, and five. And then of course, the, the higher the grade, the, it needs orthopedic referral. And uh, this can be effectively managed. Some of these types can be effectively managed by casting, but here, one important message is don't forget to tell mother and father that growth disturbance can happen with any physical fracture when you come across this kind of injuries. So as I mentioned earlier, it is a weakest area of the bone. It fails easily to tension stressors, and this is what happens with a physical injury. Then comes the bending stressors above the knee in children. Remember, in an adult, in an adult, the weakest part is in, around the knee is the ligament and not the bone. But whereas in a child, the, weakest, the ligament is stronger than the bone, therefore, therefore 
the bending stresses of the knee leads to uh, opening up at the physis and lead to physial injury. This is another type of physial injury. You can see injured side here and the uninjured side. And if you look carefully, you can see there's a there is a translation at the physial level. And then that is the that is the injury that you see on same child after six weeks and after uh, 12 weeks and then there is a very little fo callus formation and then normal, usually normal growth resumes. What happens if there's no growth? If there's significant physial injury and if there's no growth, of course, like in this x-ray, you can see physial bar formation leading to, lead to growth arrest and what is what you see in the center, uh, in the, in the whitish area in the distal radius is the physial bar. So you can see simple shortening. And this is another example of physial injury in a, in a child around the knee. So to have type 3 injury, intraarticular leading to intraarticular fracture. Two years post-injury, you see shortening and angular deformity of the knee. And this is because one side of the physis is growing faster than the other side because one side there's a growth arrest which leads to angular deformity. Then what happens when a longitudinal force is applied to a long bone in a child? So when a, it is because there is when there is thin cortex of trabecular bone, it leads to compression in when there is a longitudinal force applied and leading to this kind of injury that is called that is called torus fracture or buckling of the metaphysis. So therefore, when the woven bone which is weaker in the long bone metaphysis, this this area is weaker and this typical fracture is this typical fracture happen. And this is called torus fracture, which the word derived from tori in, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, instance. Torus fractures are common in distal radius, distal femur, and the proximal humerus. What are the other failure patterns of metaphyseal bone? Now we talked about the torus fracture. So failures depends on the type of the force which applies. If there's a minimal force, the torus fracture, if you apply some more force, you get a green stick fracture. And if you apply some more force, you get a complete fracture. So these are the failure patterns of metaphyseal bone in children. What is the possible pitfall with this pattern? You treat this fracture within a cast and if the cast is not adequately molded, you will see this kind of a displacement four weeks later. But fortunately, because there is an increased uh, remodeling capacity and greater osteogenic potential, this will remodel to a normal level after some time. So we'll come to the third type of unique fracture pattern in children. This is called plastic deformation. If you, if the children's, uh, the, bone, the bones are very, very elastic. And therefore, when certain amount of force is applied, uh, one bone get green stick fracture and other bone end up in plastic deformation. So this is a good example of a green stick, radius green stick fracture in a forearm and uh, the plastic deformation of an ulna in a child. And this ulna plastic deformation, you see there's no fracture is seen. And then this needs to be treated with uh, manipulation and anesthesia. And this is how these fractures are best treated, sustained pressure under anesthesia, over the fulcrum, and then gradual, you apply gradual but constant pressure over the fulcrum in a three-point fixation method, which is depicted here, and you can get a good reduction and good uh, correction of the deformity. And this technique is described by Saunders in 1984, initially, and this is one of the important uh, fracture types in children. Next type is the green stick factor, the fourth type. You see it is clearly explained here in this, these photographs. And you see this uh, green stick factor in this particular child. The tension side fails first and the compression side is, remains elastic, plastically deformed. So when, when one side is failed, one cortex is fractured and another cortex is intact, plastically deformed. So that is called the green stick factor. What happens when both cortices fail? When both cortices fail, obviously, it will end up in a complete fracture. So all depends on, as I showed you before, all depends on the force which applies at the beginning. 
So what is an apophysis? That is the fifth type of uh, unique factor pattern that you see in a child. Apophysis is where the muscle tendon unit. In this example, the big, so iliosus muscle is attached to the uh, lesser trochanter. The muscle tendon, the apophysis is where the where muscle tendon unit is attached to a bone. How does this structure differ from the physis? Physis has a growing capacity, but apophysis doesn't have any growing capacity. And these muscle tendon units are stronger than the apophysis, and therefore you see this avulsion at the at the uh, apophysis without any damage to the muscle tendon unit. And this is this is seen in at the children who are involved in athletic, mainly the sports activities and athletics. So this example, the groin, groin, you call it a groin pull, that is called lesser trochanter avulsions. And this, this you see it very nicely in this diagram. In this diagram. And in the x-ray that you see, this kind of a bony fragment coming out from the lesser trochanter, that is because of the apophysial avulsion. Another example is hamstring pull due to ischial apophysis avulsion. And you see this, this is in a closer view. And in the x-ray that you see this kind of a version. And finally, the, the, these children's fractures remodel very nicely. And this is one example of how it remodels and series of x-rays. And then another example of remodeling in a femur fracture four year, at the age of four years. And when the when child becomes six and a half years, how the fracture heals and how it remodels. Which occurs best in plane of motion occurs best close to the physis and occurs best with remaining, when there's a remaining growth potential, when there's uh, remaining growth potential in more than two years. But remember, the rotational deformity does not correct. And remodeling capacity is great when, def deformity, is adjusted, when it, deformity is close to the physis. This is the same patient, one year post-injury, you can see how nicely it is remodeled. And two years post-injury, you cannot see any, any factor. So the take-home messages are pediatric fractures heal rapidly, diaphysial malunions remodel if there is remaining growth potential, especially close to the epiphysis. You need to respect physial injuries. Please avoid multiple reduction attempts. Follow closely if non-operative management. Anatomical reduction is uh, recommended. If you are, if at all, if you are going for any fixation, please use smooth KYS. And if, if you are using screws, use screws parallel to the physis and not through the physis. And in the case of proximal femoral fractures in children, respect proximal femoral blood supply. Hip fractures in a child is a surgical emergency. Please remember, when you see a fracture in a child, that uh, child abuse is a possibility. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sonil Vijay Singer, for that uh, enlightening talk on fractures in children. We will move on to the next speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Pala B. Rajesh. Uh, uh, Mr. Rajesh is consultant thoracic surgeon in the Department of Surgery in the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh of United Kingdom. Uh, over to you, Dr. Rajesh. I would like to thank the organizers of the 50th uh, conference of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka. Uh, my name is Pala Rajesh, I'm the Vice President of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and I am making a presentation on cardiothoracic trauma, but I am going to be uh, pertaining mainly to chest trauma. Um, just to go through the history for a minute, the management of penetrating injuries has evolved through military experience. You will see that the mortality has decreased substantially since the First World War, when the mortality was up to 56%, uh, and it came down to about 3% during the Vietnam War. And we also notice that in practice, chest drainage is sufficient for 76% of the injuries that we encounter. 
So I'm going to present you with an overview of what we do. The basic pathophysiology of thoracic trauma, the individual conditions, the optimal early management, investigations, interventions, indications, and the incisions for access into the chest with a little bit of um, emphasis on damage control and definitive steps with follow-up after these patients have undergone their treatment. The mechanism of injury for chest trauma are threefold. It could be due to blunt injuries, penetrating, and blast injuries. Now, blunt trauma is probably the most common that we encounter. It's due to direct trauma due to chest wall injury, deceleration secondary to road traffic accidents, and crush with compression. It happens mainly in the factory environment. Now, these cause fractures, flail chest with paradoxical breathing, open wounds with um, pneumothoraces, uh, with sucking of the air from outside with secondary lung damage. Deceleration injuries cause torsion, cause tears, especially of the aorta, the ascending um, and the descending aorta, the junction. And with crush injuries, you get contusion and rupture. Now, as far as penetrating trauma is concerned, it is a problem in the United Kingdom with stabbings going up with stab wounds. Uh, impalement is very rare nowadays and gunshot wounds where there is energy transfer with projectile velocity and the movement of the projectile and also the number of projectiles, especially in shotguns, which are mainly rural. So these again can cause fractures um, hemoneumothoraces, pulmonary contusion, cardiac injuries, air embolism, and embedded foreign body. Now, it, as far as penetrating injuries are concerned, the damage depends upon the site of injury, the depth of the projectile, the direction of the projectile, and the cleanliness of the clothing and the skin. With blast injuries, these are mainly battlefield injuries and, you know, even in civilian terrorist, um, you know, uh, injuries where you get some blasts. This causes a pressure wave and the pressure wave causes tissue disruption. This results in tear to the blood vessels and alveolar tissue with severe contusions. You can end up with a disruption of the tracheobronchial tree and even myocardial contusion. What do all these things do? It causes post-traumatic respiratory failure. Why? Because of the loss of mechanics, mechanics of the chest wall, resulting in a flail chest, the flail chest causing airway obstruction, sometimes due to retained secretion, and rarely tracheobronchial disruption, and pneumothorax where there is air in the pleural cavity. This leads on to a ventilation perfusion mismatch. This is compounded by pulmonary injury, pulmonary contusion, where there's a steady trickle of blood into the alveolar space. There's a hematoma in the pleural cavity, which causes alveolar collapse and secretion retention. There is also pain secondary to the injury to the chest wall. And because of the pain, there's hyperventilation and all of these things compound to hypovolemia. This results in hypoxia because of a ventilation perfusion mismatch leading to hypercarbia and acidosis. So let's explore some of the individual con conditions. Now, chest injury is classified as central chest injury and peripheral chest injury. The central chest injury is serious, requires surgical intervention, and involves all the central conditions in the medist and central um, organs in the mediastinum, i.e., the heart, the great vessels, the trachea, the mainstem bronchi, the esophagus, the cord, and proximate intradiaphragmatic organs like the liver, spleen, and the stomach. Now, if you look at the peripheral chest injury, it mainly involves a lung parenchyma, sometimes the great vessels, and diaphragmatic injuries up to the fourth intercostal space on expiration. Now, skeletal injuries can um, be simple rib fractures, can be compound rib fractures. If there are more than four to five rib fractures on either side, it can result in a 
flail chest, resulting in paradoxical breathing. First and second rib fractures are pretty rare, and if they have fractured, then it is a substantial deceleration force with some serious underlying problems. The same holds good for sternal fracture. Now, pulmonary injuries, hemoneumothorax is the most common injury, followed by pulmonary contusion. Air embolism is rare, and embedded foreign body is secondary to um, missiles, projectiles, and with um, objects like knives in the chest. So, should anybody have done this chest x-ray? The answer is no, because that's a huge tension pneumothorax. Somebody should have recognized it in the a &E department by clinical examination. The trachea would have been deviated to the side. The patient's pulse would have been low. And on percussion, the patient's left side would have been, you know, um, easily discoverable that there's a lot of air in the chest. And just putting in a large board needle into the second intercostal space would have relieved this patient's um, problem and pushed the mediastinum back to where it should be. So this is a clinical diagnosis. You don't need a chest x-ray to make this diagnosis. Now, massive hemothorax is a bit more tricky because there's accumulation of blood in the pleural space. You could have lost between a liter to lit liter and a half or more. The patient will be in shock with respiratory compromise. So the patient needs intubation. The patient needs large bore venflon cannulae. He needs fluid. And he really needs to be transferred to the operating room. Because if you put a tube inside this patient's chest, he may just exsanguinate in front of your eyes. So the best thing to do is to transfer him to the theater, open the chest once you've got all of the necessary instruments to quickly clamp the bleeding vessels. In spite of all of this, the mortality rate in these patients is up to 75%. But just a little um, idea about the types of pulmonary lacerations that you can get. There's a type one to type four. Type 1 is when you have elastic compression causing lung rupture. This you see in young patients. Type 2 is secondary to lower chest wall compression, a shearing tear, which is rare. And then you have type 3 lacerations, which are peripheral lacerations due to rub, rib fractures, which, as you can imagine, is secondary to a spring injury where the chest moves in and out. And during that spring injury, you can lacerate the surface of the lung. And type 4 lacerations are compression next to pleuropulmonary adhesions. Now, 30 to 75 patients with significant blunt chest trauma have lung contusion. And this is frequently associated with a rib fracture. Micro hemorrhage with a steady drip, drip, drip into the chest, into the pulmonary. Um, Tissue can cause almost a liter to liter and a half blood loss. Now, this can result in progressive deterioration of ventilatory status. Systemic air embolism is rare and it's seen mainly in central penetrating injuries and pulmonary contusion. And air from this pulmonary tree into the pulmonary veins, you can get hemoptysis, you can get cerebral symptoms and shock. And the only way to um, sort out this problem is by carrying out the repair of the pulmonary injury. Now, when you see chest x-rays and patients like this, they are a self-selected group. They are not going to die. They should be removed to the operating room as soon as the survey is done and the supportive treatment has commenced in the a &E department and the in the <clears throat> missile or the weapon which you see in the chest x-ray, which is really the um, knife which is penetrated into the chest. Fortunately, it has not gone through anything that will cause the patient um, immediate fatality. The same holds good for this gentleman who was impaled when he was thrown off his motorcycle into the central reservation. 
Um, and this is not something which you, should, which you should panic, which is easily said. Diaphragmatic injuries are very rare, only 1-3% to of all penetrating chest trauma. It's more common on the left because of the space below. The right side is protected because of the liver, which, you know, is right up against the diaphragm and protects it. And it's easily missed. And there is no um, <clears throat> reason to feel bad that you missed it because partial tears of the diaphragm can convert itself into complete tears secondary to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure sometime a year, six months after the initial injury. So really only 15 to 30 percent are picked up before surgery. Mediastinal injuries are quite important because they cause senior, serious injury to vital organs. They require very careful evaluation. Sometimes they'll probably have to um, go to theatre early for hemorrhage, cardiac tamponade, and also any parasternal in, uh, entrance wounds. What I mean by that is any injury between the nipples with a line drawn from the clavicle right down to the abdomen should be explored. Stable patients need full evaluation with angiography, endoscopies, a CT of the chest and an echo, and a thoracotomy should be done based on the findings. The esophagus is well protected because it's right in the posterior mediastinum in front of the spine, and it's mainly on clinical suspicion of fever, pain, and tachycardia that you pick this up. If there is any paramediastinal gas or a pleural effusion on the chest x-ray, mainly on the left side, what you need to do is to confirm by doing an endoscopy or a gastrograph and swallow. Tracheobronchial injuries are again rare. The incidence is very low, 0.03. The, I probably have seen about three in the whole of my career. And what you see is a fantastic X-ray of a dropped lung, where you have a dehiscence between either the carina and the main bronchus or a tracheobronchial dehiscence. This uh, condition needs immediate transfer to the operating room and a specialist uh, thoracic anesthetist to deal with the rupture, um, to pass a double lumen tube, and for a specialist thoracic surgeon to do a primary repair. Now, sometimes in the field, you need to do some basic um, management, and there are only three things which you need to manage in the field. One is a sucking chest wound by putting a big um, pad on it, and securing it tightly, a tension pneumothorax, which again is a clinical diagnosis where the trachea is deviated to the opposite side. You put in a large bore needle to relieve the pneumothorax and a pericardial tamponade. Now, the early management of thoracic trauma is really by primary and secondary survey, chest x-ray, arterial blood gas, ECG, pulse oximetry, and regular bloods to be sent away, establish the type of in injury, and then an erect chest X-ray or a CT if the patient is stable and if it's appropriate. Any high index of suspicion, get a chest X-ray done. If there's a hematorax or a widened mediastinum, get a contrast CT scan done. If it is necessary, do an angiography, because what you don't want to do is to miss something like this. Look at this. This is an widened mediastinum, contrast CT has shown that there is blood in the mediastinum with a tear in the descending aorta, and this is an angiogram which is confirmed with. So with tracheobronchial injuries, an endoscopy, careful intubation, generally specialist repair with double lumen intubation, and selective ventilation. Now, after the operative procedure, in my unit, in my experience, we've never ventilated these patients. The patients are always left self-ventilating. So in civilian practice, supportive therapy, fluids, pain control, 
antibiotics and chest drainage will sufficiently treat 70 to 85 percent of patients. The remaining 15 patients will require major intervention as I have alluded to during my talk. I've said this just now, antibiotics, adequate pain relief, including epidural or paravertebral blocks, humidified oxygen and nebulizers, chest figure therapy, and mobilize these patients as quickly as possible. The insertion of the chest drain should be done in the triangle of safety, which is in the fourth to fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line with an adequate size tube to drain both air and fluid. Pericardiocentesis is a bit more tricky. I would suggest that this is left to specialists. It is not done in the field if it is possible and if it can be transferred to a center, it's best done with echocardiographic control. Now, for thoracic injuries, there are some which are life-saving emergency operations. It's called damage control. And there's early surgery for major injuries, and there's some late surgery for sequelae of the injuries. Now, if you look at emergency thoracotomy, this is really to control massive bleeding. This is to provide direct cardiac massage because the patient is collapsed and shocked. And it's also very rarely to clamp the pulmonary hilum because that's where the patient is exsanguinating from. But that carries a very high mortality indeed. Now, the indications are if there's acute deterioration and hemodynamics instability, if there's massive hemorrhage loss of greater than two liters in the first four hours, 200 mils per hour while under observation for four continuous hours or 400 mils in any one hour. So that, if you like, is an indication for early thoracotomy. Massive air leak, tracheobronchial injuries, and air embolism. Variety of approaches, subxiphoid pericardial window, left anterior thoracotomy if the problem's mainly in the left, a clamshell if it is in the mediastinum, and a lateral thoracotomy and a median sternotomy in specialist centers when the patients are stabilized and uh, can be taken to the appropriate center prior to any surgical intervention. Now, surgical procedures for the lung, you can suture the lung, you can do a tractotomy, you can do a wedge excision, sometimes a lobectomy, which is rare if the vessels and the bronchus are, are involved, uh, and pneumonectomy, very rare, Tracheobronchial repair, again, very rare, and vascular injuries, again, quite rare. Just to show you what you can do with a, with a small lung laceration there, um, you can either suture it with 2 o or 3 or proline, or you staple it with linear cutters. Tractotomy, again, is when a missile has passed through, through and through, and there is um, a massive air leak. What you can do is you can open the tract, staple it off, and then oversew it. Emergency pneumonectomy, very rare indeed. I probably have done a couple, and I probably have lost both of them. You use a giant stapler, you put it right across the hilum, and it's really salvage surgery. And even if you are successful, as my colleague once had in my department, you get acute lung injury on the contralateral side. Chest wall defects, put a big pad, transfer to the, put a chest strain, transfer to the closest specialist center for them to, to deal with it. Esophageal injury depends on the size, depends on the um, area. You can either drain it by putting a tube through, you can divert by doing a cervical esophagostomy, most importantly, if you can do a primary closure, do it and avoid a resection. Antibiotics and nutritional support and most of these fetal injuries will take care of itself. Again, closure could be mass closure, layer closure, depends on the site and depends on the expertise. Antibiotics, mandatory. Follow up chest x-rays in clinic. And if you've done damage control, then specialist opinion should be sought fairly quickly and further evaluation and investigations should be carried out. 
What about surgery for sequelae of trauma, persistent air leak, retained hemothorax, empyema and retained foreign bodies? You can either do it through a thoracotomy or you can do it through a minimal access thoracoscopy in uh, specialist centers where you can do all of these things by evacuating retained hemothorax, by controlling um, minor hemorrhage on the chest wall, by evacuating empyema to reinflate the lung and to remove re retained foreign bodies like this piece of glass which is sitting right on the edge of the diaphragm. So in conclusion, supportive therapy and chest drainage will sufficiently treat 70 to 85 percent of patients. The remaining 15 percent will require major surgical intervention. Surgery has a wide spectrum with various levels of morbidity and mortality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh, for that uh, excellent lecture on chest trauma. Uh, we come to the final uh, presentation of this session. It's done by uh, Dr. Saman Pushpakumara. He is a consultant neurosurgeon at the General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. And he's going to talk to us on the outcome of early neurosurgical intervention after spinal cord injury. Over to you, Dr. Pushpakumar. Afternoon, Chairperson, sir, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm going to present a brief description about the outcome of early surgical intervention following spinal cord injury. Um, my brief presentation is going to span over these subtopics over the next 15 minutes. As we all know, spinal cord injury is defined as damage to the spinal cord with or without associated damage to the vertebral column. It's almost universally known concept to most people about the primary brain injury and secondary brain injury. And our primary objective of head injury management is to minimize secondary brain injury. Similarly, there, there is primary spinal cord injury, which will be followed by secondary cord injury for a much longer period than secondary brain injury, unless we properly manage. So the whole idea of early surgical intervention after spinal cord injury is to prevent secondary cord injury. In general, early intervention is considered as optimal surgical management within 24 hours of injury. However, newer data favors that even earlier intervention is better. So primary cord injury could be of wide range like cord contusions, traction injuries, it may be complete or partial transection of the cord. It may be mechanical compression by fractured or dislocated vertebra or ruptured or prolapsed intervertebral disc. Whatever the mechanism, primary cord injury results in mechanical damage to neural membranes, extracellular matrix architecture, and microvasculature. So, this will trigger a secondary injury cascade. From the moment of insult, and it may continue for years, as I mentioned, unless we properly manage, and this ongoing secondary injury will lead to ongoing neural injury, as well as further dysfunction of the cord function. So, within minutes of the primary injury, there will be hemorrhage. You can see the black spot of hemorrhage with surrounding edema and disruption of the blood spinal cord barrier with rapid influx of inflammatory cells, such as polymorphonuclear leukocytes and macrophages, as well as cytokines. Also, damage to neuronal membrane will lead to ionic dysregulation, releasing byproducts of cellular necrosis such as DNA and ATP. Within hours, 
this in secondary injury cascade will trigger pro-apoptotic signaling in the nearby cells. Also, phagocytes trying to clear the debris will generate free radicals, which will cause further cellular injury. And all these pathological processes will be further compounded by the compromised microvasculature leading to lesional and perilesional ischemia. And this will set in a vicious cycle where the increasing edema will further compress the cord, further impairing microvasculature and worsening the ischemia and causing more and more neurogial de cell death, setting in a vicious cycle. In the long term, this will lead to scarring of the spinal cord and the arachnoid additions causing impairment of CSF flow can end up with syrinx formation either locally at the point of injury or it may be quite extensive and widespread with multiple septa, causing the management really challenging. The question is, can the neurosurgeon or the spinal surgeon help to hold this cascade of secondary injury? The answer is yes. This is where we can intervene as early as possible, do an adequate decompression and fixation, and break this vicious cycle continuing. So early and adequate surgical decompression, usually coupled with instrumental fixation, relieve mechanical stretch and compression on the neural tissue. Also, it relieving the pressure within the cord parenchyma will at least partially restore microvascular blood flow, reducing ischemia. Uh, so Sa this Dr. will Saman, minimize I, the ongoing Saman, secondary damage you, uh, as well as it will provide an optimal environment for surviving neurons to recover from the injury. So what are these indications for early surgical intervention? Whenever there is unstable spine, as it can cause further injury unless fixation is done, as well as it will delay the rehabilitation unless surgically fixed. Whenever there is compression by fractured or dislocated vertebrae or disc material, then whenever there is already existing cord compression, for example, due to degenerative disease and compound the acute cord injury. Again, early decompression will provide an optimal environment for the spinal cord to recover. Also, central cord syndrome is a relative indication as there is some evidence to support Dr. Pushpakumara, uh, you had to share your screen and advance the slides. I think you are still on the first slide. Yes. Can you attend to that, yes. please? Yes, I'm really sorry you about it. I don't know what show. technical error has happened. So I'll share the screen and I will do the presentation. Uh, technical uh, difficulty that Dr. happens with Dr. can we start the presentation from the beginning? Yeah, sure. This is the beginning of the presentation. Yeah, so first, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the uh, College of Surgeons and the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to present a brief uh, coverage over the outcome of early surgical intervention following spinal cord injury. So my present, short presentation will span over these subtopics. So as you all know, as we all know, the spinal cord is defined as a, spinal cord injury is defined as the damage to the spinal cord with or without association damage to the vertebral column. And you can see the two differences in the either picture. So it's a well-known concept to almost everyone that the primary brain, there is something called primary brain injury and it will be followed by secondary brain injury and our management of head injury patients is essentially targeted on preventing or minimizing the secondary brain injury. 
more importantly there is similar primary and secondary cord injury and the secondary cord injury may go on for years and years not like the secondary brain injury so the whole idea of our early surgical intervention is to prevent or minimize this secondary cord injury so in general this definition of early intervention is considered as optimal surgical management within 24 hours of injury however there are so many newer data favoring that even earlier intervention will give better outcome so there are a wide range of cord injuries like cord contusions traction injuries which are more common whenever there is already existing degenerative changes causing cord compression and they can there can be either complete or partial transection or mechanical compression by either fractured segments of the vertebra or maybe a dislocated vertebra what we call as spondylolisthesis or it may be even collapsed or ruptured intervertebral disc due to the trauma so whatever the mechanism this primary cord injury will result in mechanical damage to neuroglial cell membranes extracellular matrix architecture which is very fine in the spinal cord and the very delicate microvasculature so the secondary cascade started from the moment of insult may go on for years as i mentioned unless we manage properly and this will process will continue ongoing damage and dysfunction for years so within minutes there can be a hemorrhage you can see this black spot of hematoma with surrounding edema with disruption of blood spinal cord barrier and this will lead to rapid influx of inflammatory cells and cytokines and the damage to the neuronal membrane cellular membrane will lead to ionic dysregulation and loss of sodium control and release of byproducts of cellular necrosis within hours there will be proapoptotic signaling to the nearby cells so further death of neurons and the phagocytes will come to clear debris and they will generate free radicals and that will add to further cellular injury so all these pathological processes will be further compounded by the compromised microvasculature leading to lesional or peri and perilesional ischemia so this will go in a vicious cycle the increasing edema will further compress the cord and it will further impair the microvasculature and ischemia will be worse and it will lead to more and more neuronal death and this will go on a vicious cycle so in the long term this can lead to scarring you can see the old scar of the cord or it may cause arachnoid adhesions which can lead to impaired csa flow and final syrinx formation either locally at the site of injury or it may be quite widespread with septic and management may be quite challenging so the question is can the neurosurgeon or the spinal surgeon help to hold this cascade of secondary injury the answer is yes this is where we can intervene and we can do early decompression and fixation of the cord so that we break this vicious cycle so early and adequate surgical decompression usually we have to couple with the instrumental fixation in the case of trauma to maintain the stability this will relieve the mechanical stretch or compression on the neural tissue as well as this will relieve the pressure within the cord parenchyma so that will at least partially restore the microvascular blood flow reducing ischemia this is quite similar to decompressive craniectomy we do for cerebral edema after head injury so this will minimize the ongoing secondary damage and this will provide an optimal environment for neurons to recover from the insult so there are clear cut indications one thing is unstable in uh, spine if you leave it alone with every movement there will be further and further damage and whenever there is compression by fractured or dislocated vertebrae or disc material you need to give adequate space for the surviving neurons to maintain the survival and recover and as i mentioned whenever there is already existing compression compounded by acute injury again relieving this compression will provide an optimal environment for the for recovery and of course now they are talking about a relative indication of central core syndrome as there are some evidences are appearing because historically central core syndrome was managed conservatively but there are certain evidences to support that early surgery
may give a positive results. So do we have evidence to support early intervention? There are so many. The, this is the first one, the stasis, so the surgical timing in acute spinal cord injury study is the first well-designed study published in 2012, which was a multi-center and non-randomized prospective study enrolling 330 individual uh, adults with cervical cord injury from six North American centers, where 182 underwent early decompression within 24 hours and other 131, the control group, underwent surgery after 24 hours. And they took their primary endpoint as the change in American Spinal Injury Association, that is Asia, impairment scale, grade at six months after the injury. So they found the significant greater proportion who underwent early surgery demonstrated two or more great improvement compared to the study group who underwent late surgery. Also, this positive benefit, positive effect, effect persisted even after correction for preoperative neurological deficits and steroid administration. Also, complication rates were comparable. In fact, they were better in the early group. Also, Marco Jack and his colleagues published their data, the research findings in 2015 in the Journal of Neurotrauma, where they study the outcome of surgical decompression within eight hours versus within eight to 24 hours. And they are all patients were Asia grade A to C, that's the poorest grade patients with MRI confirmed cord compression. And when they compare 22 patients who underwent early surgery within eight hours versus another 20 who underwent between eight to 24 hours, they had the same primary outcome or endpoint like the previous research, the outcome at six months, they found 45% of early surgery group showed an improvement, whereas only 10% in the late group showed such an improvement, which was statistically significant. Similarly, John F. Group and his colleagues published their data very recently in 2019 in the Journal of Neurosurgery, where they compare the outcome in the ultra early group, they mentioned that word ultra early group for within first 12 hours, an early group of 12 to 24 hours and late group after 24 hours. And they compare the outcome from admission to discharge. So what they noted was this ultra early group within operated within 12 hours showed an average improvement of Asia impairment scale by 1.5 compared to 0.5 in the other two groups. Also, more interestingly, interestingly, not about 90% of the AIS grade A patients, that is the poorest, poorest grade patients with complete sensory motor and sphincter impairment, they improved by the grade B or higher grade in this ultra early group. So this is what Charlie Tater said in 1982, that final outcome of spinal cord injury depends upon the accuracy, adequacy and speed of first stage management diagnosis and treatment within the first few hours and it is very even for today. So the steering committee of the consortium for the spinal cord medicine USA recommend consider early spinal canal decompression in the setting of deteriorating spinal cord injury as a practice option and that may improve neurological recovery. And also they recommend to consider early stabilized spinal stabilization whenever indicated. Also, the spinal trauma study group recommends that the first 24 hours as the most promising time window during which decompression may afford neuroprotection. Unfortunately, even in the Western world, less than half of the patient will arrive in a spinal care center within 24 hours where the decompression becomes an option. There are so many practical difficulties. There may be priorities for other life-threatening injuries in victims of polytrauma. There may be problems with the transport. That sometimes the imaging facilities may be available, limited. Some, we are talking about high-end MRI. Sometimes this may be all what a peripheral center has. And you may need really vigilant eyes to diagnose injury in such situations. So, 
there may be limited access to neurosurgeons or a spinal surgeon and limited availability of operating time the icu care facilities and especially in our setup attitudes of patients to society and sadly even doctors plays a major role so chair person sir in conclusion i would like to highlight that traumatic spinal cord injuries have devastating lifelong sequelae for the victims caregivers as well as the society and although not 100% improved even modest improvements in sensory motor function can significantly enhance the quality of life and decrease the cost of care and also early surgical decompression of the injured spinal cord is one of the few available interventions that can potentially alter the long term recovery trajectory and early surgical decompression is quite safe without any increased risk of adverse events or complications thank you right. uh, thank you uh, dr saman kushukumar for that elaborate description on spinal injuries uh, so that would conclude uh, the symposium 16 of the sri lanka surgical congress and uh, thank you all for very thank you very much for all the speakers who participated in this thank you uh, good morning and uh, welcome to this 14th symposium uh, of the college of surgeons sessions uh, brought to you in conjunction with the association of plastic surgeons of sri lanka so uh, we decided to um, brought a subject that has not been discussed i think in the, this sort of symposium before and that is facial trauma which uh, i think is very pertinent to almost all uh, surgeons working in the peripheries that you have to deal with so we are trying to uh, give you some pearls and some wisdom that we have gained uh, on the management to of the facial, uh, facial trauma that will likely give you a better outcome so uh, our panel consists of uh, dr arunajit amrasinghe who will discuss the the bony reconstruction uh, dr gayan ekanayaka who is going to discuss uh, the special areas that need a different approach and uh, dr yasa sabe vikrama who will um, discuss the management of the soft tissues so what do you dr arunajit amrasinghe want to discuss uh, Uh, uh how to reconstruct the foundation video on good morning i'm going to take talk about laying the foundation for reconstruction of injured face by building the facial skeleton facial fractures are less common but if poorly treated they can result in significant facial disfigurement as well as functional deficits so as plastic surgeons we always aim to restore form and function of these structures to their pre injury state like in any other injury thorough knowledge of the anatomy of the region is very important this should include skeletal anatomy as well as soft tissue anatomy because there are very important soft tissue structures in the vicinity we can broadly classify the facial fractures according to the vertical thirds of the face we use the term pan facial fractures for the fractures involving all three areas some of the facial fractures are common these are nasal fractures orbital floor fractures zygoma infraorbital rim mandibular fractures and these are followed by frontal sinus naso orbitoethmoidal and lefo type mid facial fractures there are some major concerns associated with facial fractures these include intracranial injuries cervical spine injuries ocular injuries and at the same time this can result in massive hemorrhage in significant number of cases and airway obstruction evaluation of patients with facial fractures should closely follow advanced trauma life support guidelines because some of this can be uh, major trauma scenarios so special attention should 
be paid to airway patency and cervical spinal injuries. In the secondary survey, a thorough assessment of each of the areas for the clinical features of the fractures as well as their complications. For example, this shows a step in the occlusal plane with a ruptured gingiva and a hematoma as a result of a mandibular fracture. X-rays are useful in the assessment, especially when they are carefully prescribed. But the main workhorse investigation is the CT scan. Uh, we should uh, assess in detail the 3D reconstruction as well as axial cuts in order to get the, get the maximum amount of information about these fractures. The management options can be variable. Some of the minimally displaced fractures and stable ones can be managed conservatively with observation, while some may be suitable for non-surgical interventions such as arch bars, maxillomandibular fusion, uh, fixation, and palatal splints. Yet some will need open reduction and internal fixation. Even with the above uh, approaches, we may still need late reconstruction for residual deformities possibly with osteotomies. And at the same time, we always have the option of simple cosmetic correction of these defects with only implants and fat transfers. When indicated, timing of surgery can be variable. There are some indications for emergency treatment of facial fractures, whereas most of them can be managed in the acute stage in the first few days after the injury. Uh, as plastic surgeons, we prefer to adhere to this approach because we can address the soft tissue problems more effectively this, during this period. Still, some physicians would prefer to uh, do the fixation as delayed procedures once the edema has settled. As I already mentioned, they might need secondary procedures for correction. Now, there are some indications for emergency treatment of facial injuries, which are mostly due to ocular and infracranial injuries, and at the same time, massive bleeding and airway obstruction. Knowledge about the facial buttresses is very important in understanding the stability of the fractures, as well as planning out stable fixation of uh, these fractures. So these vertical and transverse buttresses are the solid bony columns in the facial skeleton, which is otherwise mostly consist of cancerous bone. There's a wide range of surgical exposure techniques available to gain access to the facial skeleton. Upper third of the face can be conveniently approached via a coronal approach whereas there are a multitude of exposures for mid-face, which include Gilly's approach, buccal sulcus, upper eyelid approach, subciliary, transconjunctival approach, and many more. There are several transoral and transcervical approaches available for the mandibular fractures. One other important uh, Exposure method is via available laceration, which can be in any part of the facial skeleton. Let's discuss about some of these fractures. Frontus, frontal sinus fractures uh, are relatively common. Their severity can depend on uh, the involvement of anterior and posterior tables and the level of combination and presence of CSF leakage. These fractures can alter forehead projection and brow position significantly if untreated. Management options are variable, some of them being uh, amenable to conservative management, while some need open reduction and further procedures. So uh, some of the anterior uh, table fractures can be managed with simple open reduction and internal fixation, whereas comminuted fractures will need sinus obliteration with uh, remo removal of sinus mucosa, whereas 
comminuted uh, posterior table fractures will warrant cranialization procedures with complete excision of posterior uh, wall of the sinus. This is a picture of a pericranial flap we frequently use for uh, sinus obliteration. Orbital fractures can either be a single wall involvement or multi-wall involvement. Uh, and simple blowout fracture is a specific uh, entity where only the floor, the, the thin bone uh, lamina of the floor is involved. Features to look for include diplopia and an ophthalmus. And uh, goal of treatment will be to restore orbital volume and ocular movements. Naso orbitoethmoidal fractures are of main three types depending on the uh, extent of comminution of the fragments and the stability of the medial canthal ligament. Uh, this can result in hypertelorism and an enophthalmos uh, if not treated, treated properly. NOE fracture repair can be challenging, especially if it is comminuted. So our aim is to attain correct positioning of the medial canthus both in horizontal and vertical planes, which might need transnasal wiring. And concurrent management of nasolacrimal system may be necessary. Nasal bone fractures are very common. Most, some of them can be managed conservatively with observation, but most of them will need close reduction and splinting, whereas some will need open reduction or secondary correction with open rhinoplasty. Zygoma fractures can be isolated arch fractures or complete zygomatic complex fractures. There's a variety of closed and open management techniques available, where in open reduction and internal fixation, we uh, use fixation of one to four points, depending on the instability of the fracture. Left four fractures are complex fractures of the mid phase, left four one being the horizontal maxillary fracture and two being the pyramidal fracture and left four three being the com complete craniofacial separation. These can significantly alter facial profile and personality. So in, when, when the indicated treatment should aim at mid facial repair with restoration of vertical and horizontal, horizontal buttresses as we already discussed. Palatoalveolar fractures are usually associated with left or type 1 or other complex facial fractures. Some of them can be managed conservatively or non-operatively, and some will need internal fixation. There's a wide range of mandibular fractures involving different parts of this complex three-dimensional structure. The fractures can affect facial profile and dental occlusion quite significantly. The stability of the fractures and favorability for uh, conservative management will depend on the biomechanical actions uh, resulted by the multiple muscular uh, insertions onto the mandible. Some of them can be managed conservatively uh, or with uh, non-operative interventions. And there's a variety of open reduction and internal fixation techniques available with load sharing and load bearing constructs, depending on the fracture anatomy. Pan facial fractures are the fractures involving the uh, hall of the facial skeleton. Goal in treatment of these fractures is to establish anatomy in all three dimensions. This is achieved by plating craniofacial buttresses for stability. So the sequencing of uh, fixation of these pan facial fractures can either be top downwards or bottom upwards, depending on the more reliable uh, fragmentation patterns. Let's look at some of the clinical examples. This gentleman following a road traffic accident, uh, 
had a left frontal sinus fracture, left orbital fracture, and zygomatic complex fracture. So we approached through coronal, subconjunctival, and buccal sulcus approaches. An outer table of the sin uh, frontal sinus was repaired with mesh plate. Orbital reconstruction was carried out with titanium mini plates and mesh, and three-point fixation for zygoma. An immediate post-operative, we have uh, achieved restoration of front, uh, the forehead projection, eyebrow, eyebrow positioning, and uh, zygomatic projection. Uh, this gentleman uh, unfortunately had a right globe rupture following road traffic accident. He also had right frontal sinus fracture with bone loss and a right NOE fracture. We operated through coronal approach and the available laceration in the periorbital region. We managed to uh, repair the frontal sinus, reconstruct it with min, uh, mini plates and mesh due to bone loss. And an NOE fracture was fixed with titanium mesh, again due to bone loss. And we have repositioned the medial canthus uh, and, then, uh, at, and uh, successfully restored uh, orbital projection and volume for future uh, prosthetic eye placement. In summary, timely and comprehensive management of facial fractures backed by rational decision making will provide optimal foundation for the reconstruction of facial injuries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arunjit. Uh, next speaker, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Yasser Sabe Vikrama, consultant plastic surgeon at uh, Colombo South Teaching Hospital, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, over to you, Yasser. Thank you. Good morning. I thank the College of Surgeons uh, for this opportunity uh, for the combined plastic, association of plastic surgeons and College of Surgeons collaborative event on facial trauma uh, to become a reality. Uh, going for optimal aesthetic outcomes in facial trauma. Face across times, across cultures, is the main attraction in the human aesthetic body. Facial trauma management principles of cosmetic uh, aesthetic for aesthetic outcomes includes the assessment and stabilization, analgesia, infection control, proper debridement and washout as early as possible, and obtaining early cover, optimally primary healing, and injury repair, preserving or reconstructing function and form. You can't overemphasize the importance of proper rehabilitation, scar management, and follow-up. We have a varied range of injuries, cutting, cut, crush, lacerations, so on and so forth, and injuries can be combined as well. The mechanisms may be due to falls, activities of daily living, sports, violence, animal attacks, recreational activities, and also self-intended injuries. Assessment and stabilization, according to ATLS guidelines, is essential to make sure patients, patient is safe. Securing the airway, hemorrhage control, identifying head injuries and cervical spine injuries, and also we have to bear in mind to assess any craniofacial injuries and also to make sure that ocular injuries are assessed. 
and relevant imaging is done. Regarding the wound, the initial debridement should be done by an experienced clinician within first six hours optimally, at least within the first 12 hours, and with irrigation with normal saline to remove foreign bodies and remove uh, uh, dirt and blood clots, and debriding the non-vital tissue, but being very conservative in the excisions because the face has a very good blood supply with good healing and also even millimetric differences may affect the symmetry and the uh, anatomy. Achieving good hemostasis and having a proper knowledge of anatomy is important to minimize injury to vital structures and also we have to make sure that for, uh, foreign bodies are looked for and removed. Planning our repair or reconstruction, main objective is going for primary healing, respecting the anatomical and landmarks in the face as well as the symmetry. Injuries to the bony framework, as emphasized by uh, Dr. Arunjit in the, the other lecture, is important and respecting the resting skin tension lines, which will be a guide to plan our incisions and repairs to have minimal scar hypertrophy and scar complications. Functional concerns like nerve injuries, muscle injuries, and assessing the tissue damage or loss will be taken into account in planning our reconstruction or cover, whether to obtain primary cover or to bring in tissues locally or regionally or distally with flaps. As I mentioned, timing is important to uh, do the reconstruction or cover before the colonization or infection occurs, ideally within six hours, and also before the edema sets in and disturbs the tensionless healing. The type of anesthesia may be general anesthesia, local anesthesia, or local anesthesia with sedation. A knowledge of the neural anatomy of the face and the points where local anesthetics can be administered is very helpful for the clinician to minimize general surgery under general anesthesia and anesthetic drugs such as lignocaine with adrenaline and silocaine uh, gives very good local anesthetic cover for our procedures. Surgical decision making is made on the reconstructive ladder or the reconstructive escalator starting from the lower strung healing is secondary intention, which is not much of an option in facial trauma. So we primarily try to go for healing with primary intention. However, where it cannot be achieved, the objective is to replace like with like. So before skin drafts, the local and regional flaps are considered uh, to bring like tissues to the to our defects. Executing the repair, identify the anatomical landmarks, anatomical layers of the damaged tissue and repairing them in layers using fine sutures for the deeper su uh, muscles and fascia. Uh, we can use 3-0 to 5-0 absorber sutures and skin sutures are usually 5-0 and 5-0, 6-0 and 7-0 are being used. Atraumatic tissue handling, use of skin hooks and fine instruments and attentionless repair gives good outcomes. A good lighting and good assistance and magnification 
usually 2.5 magnification, uh, group mag magnification helps our repairs. Few examples, newborn child with forceps trauma, primarily debrided and after, this is after two months, after six months, the other twin could not be identified from the injured twin. So objective is going for healing with primary intention. Again, this young girl, the scar is not transfer. Transfer scars are in line with the resting skin tension lines. This is oblique, so we have debrided it and repaired, and she will have to undergo meticulous scar management to make sure there is no scar hypertrophy. This common injury in the cheek by falling from motorcycle, had to, the tissue had to be brought in means of a flap to cover the defect. Guyan will further emphasize. I brought in this slide, though this does not look very aesthetic, with the available challenge, we had to bring in tissue to reconstruct the forehead and cover the bone, and we have used a thick, split thickness skin graft for the left side of the forehead to create an acceptable aesthetic outcome. Burns in the face are very important that we get minimal scar outcomes and functional, good functional outcomes. Always refer to the local burns units managed by general surgeons or plastic surgeons is recommended for best outcomes. This series of slides emphasizes the importance and the advantage of proper debri initial debridement, washout, and closure. This is a dog bite injury, and especially in dog bites, the maximal contamination is in the skin edges. So the principle is to excise the wound edges, and also within there will be a deep cavity of uh, tissue damage. You have to wash it well. And after that, the patient can undergo primary suturing, as opposed to the previous belief of secondary suturing or a delayed primary suturing after two days. And this is the outcome of the patient after six weeks on scar management. As I mentioned, functional defects also have to be identified with the injuries and treatment organized. Rehabilitation, which is a very important integral part, has to be considered and also a good follow-up. Non-surgical management of scars, like scar massaging, taping, and gels and gel sheet application, silicone gel sheets, and for hypertrophy scars, steroid injections, uh, and uh, laser treatments are available and revision, surgical revisions with like excisions, redirections, resurfacing and skin grafts, then Z plasty, W plasty, the traditional corrective techniques and using of stem cells and micro fat injections are also available. Then combined treatments like for keloids like excision and radiotherapy within the first 24 hours is also a uh, successful treatment. So, having this young child with this uh, lateral canthal injury without many, any trace of scars was achieved with good scar management and rehabilitation. In summary, for fa facial injuries, soft tissue management, excluding life-threatening injuries, preserving function and form when planning reconstruction or cover, aiming primary healing, atraumatic tissue handling, and rehabilitation and follow-up are emphasized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Asas, um, for that presentation. Uh, so the next uh, part of the uh, uh, symposium will be done by Dr. Gayan uh, Kanayaka on the management of special areas.
Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman Sir, I would like to take on the discussion from where the other speakers have um, uh, stopped into the reconstruction of special areas of the base. Now, special areas, I'm sure if the whole space, space is a special area, but there are certain areas that we as even as plastic surgeons cannot re recreate totally. And these are the areas that I, if I may discuss, eyes, nose, ears, and mouth. Uh, due to the restriction of time, I'll just quickly go through these areas where I would like to discuss the eye with regard to the eyebrow, eyelid, lobe, and functional reconstruction. And the brow is a very aesthetic organ where the lot loss will cause tremendous impact on the patient. And these tiny lesions, although they seem to be having a loss, they are usually uh, directly closed and they get a very good result. However, the problem starts when they are in their hair loss, which is visible, and that can either be managed by excision of the scar or sometimes transplanting uh, the lost hair from the other side. Now, the problem is when you have lead losses like this, where this segment might not survive. And uh, we follow a simple algorithm where, where we see where there's lead closure is possible and to an extent where we have to do superficial temporal artery based islander flaps where we get some hair bearing area to act like an eyebrow. Then we move on to the eyelid, which is one of the complex structures that we see. And this is a classic example where the upper eyelid has been lost and the lower eyelid will be used to reconstruct the upper eyelid. Now, the the how we insert is that we need to change the direction of the hair follicles or the eyelashes and it is attached like a new and after about three, two to three week, two weeks, we detach it totally and reinsert it to recreate the uh, upper eyelid. Now, the lower eyelid is then recreated with this facial skin moved across. So this is a very uh, typical standard upper lid reconstruction. However, there are certain individuals who come like this. It's a, it's a one in a lifetime uh, patients that we get four eyelids loss and final outcome we had to use four flaps like this. So, but remember that none of these flaps were, um, flaps could be functioning as normal eyelid. So still we are yet to determine what is best as a um, functional eye. Now when the globe is lost, now this young chap has a eye, eye globe lost, not due to trauma though, but it's the same in, in trauma. And this is another gentleman with an eye globe which is sunken in, which is known as naphthalmus. So what do we do? This is simple processes. It's very nice and it's very aesthetic. And um, the other chap had a lot of cartilage put inside his eye globe, so the eye, eye ball or the globe gets propped up. And he, eventually he had other surgeries to correct this uh, uh, inferior rectus palsy as well. Now, when it comes to the functional reconstruction of the eyelid, now the question is well, the blink or the lid closure and the blink reconstruction. So it's it cannot be uh, reconstructed without the use of the other side nerve. We can use a spare nerve, facial nerve from the other side branch and put a nerve graft to this side. And then in secondarily, once the tenal sign moves up to here, that means the nerve has grown, we use this platysma muscle flap to reconstruct the new orbicularis oris. As you can see, it's a, one of the most complex structures that we have and it's there is still more research going on to reconstruct the best possible eyelid, um, functional eyelid. Now, when it comes to the nose, the skin, skeleton and the nares are the most uh, critical areas that we come across 
and challenging area. So this gentleman came with a human bite, which is a um, which is a very difficult uh, condition to reconstruct. And uh, you can, as you can see, the nose has been reconstructed with a forehead flap. Remember, this is one of the first flaps that's described in the world, uh, described by Sushruta, the father of plastic surgery himself. And uh, this is after stage two. And finally, we get something like this. Although there's a color mismatch, we should be able to address that. Again, now we go into the skeleton where the nasal skeleton is mainly bone and cartilage and we move into um, a reconstruction complex like this or we go into something like this where where it is, although you think it's reconstruction, but the, but the repair itself gives a very good outcome. Then the, for the final outcome only we use reconstruction with costal cartilages. And we move on to the uh, case before this. And what did we do for this gentleman with a human bite? And uh, we needed to put cartilage. So there was cartilage in place of his original cartilages, which is lost. So these are fossil cartilages covered with a forehead flap. It's a complex reconstruction. And uh, when it comes to the nares, still it is going to be one of the very difficult uh, conditions to treat. This gentleman had uh, acid burns and complete occlusion of the nares. We had to reconstruct using another forehead flap, which gives nice nares, so it could keep uh, the normal capacity is open. Now the free tissue transfer is the option for a gentleman like this who wishes to not to have any more scars on the face, big scars that mean, and we had to reconstruct with something taken from the ear uh, and it's it's actually very very aesthetically matching to the uh, to the ala of the nose with the total subunit. Remember the when we reconstruct nose nose always have to be a functional sub subunit reconstruction where we have to, even if it's a small area, we have to replace the whole subunit of the nose to get an aesthetic outcome. Now, moving on to the ear, which is another difficult area, can, uh, when you appreciate this uh, appearance and the entire convoluted appearance of this uh, magnificent cartilage, the skin loss, itself is a challenge sometimes because it will distort this ear. So in this case, of course, we have we had to put, put use the posterior skin and advance it. So and turn it over so it just covers the um, and reconstruct the helical rim. Uh, just a simple example here. And the next one is a bit of a difficult reconstruction where you have a composite tissue loss, where the cartilage is lost and also some skin has uh, has disappeared from uh, due to from. So the option is to make something similar like this. This is actually for microtia, but we do an entire reconstruction of ear uh, uh, um, cartilage. And this is quite interesting because we use this flap, which is known as the temporoparietal flap, uh, based on the superior temporal artery, and use it to cover this reconstructed ear. So the reconstruction is taken through one of these perforations and covered uh, covered subsequently with a skin graft, full thickness skin graft like this. And meatus, of course, meatus uh, obstruction has to be reconstructed with skin uh, or composite flap taken from behind the ear and interposing the meatal stenosis that has been released. When we come to the mouth, which is an important uh, uh, area, which because simply because it has several key components, the most important component being the skin. Of course, you know when the skin is damaged like this, it's definitely going to um, scar the patients forever. Now, this is a burn, which is a very this is the commonest form of skin damage in our uh, country, where we had to recreate this sulcus between the red lip and the skin 
skin of the lip and that was this is an advancement plug that we had to do and finally uh, once this this um, this uh, gap is uh, this uh, nice uh, uh, crease is created we had to expand the neck with the tissue expander and the in resurface the entire burnt area of the lower um, face and as you can see it see she's still undergoing uh, a lot of scar therapy so it has uh, its downside that it's, it's, it really requires a lot of effort and time and from the patient also and also from us. Now this gentleman had a lip loss due to trauma and uh, if you just suture it it will look very abnormal. So the trick is to treat the mucosa separate and treat the muscle separate. So the muscle has been approximated on its merit because there are two segments of the muscle, which is on the red lip, inside the red lip, there's a nice uh, uh, muscle that closes the uh, oral aperture as well as the uh, big muscle, big govicular, all its parts. So this, this is um, also this doesn't need repair, but oh, uh, uh, this has to be separated and repaired separately and closed by using the mucosa. And uh, this is another extreme example where we had to lose more than half of the lip and we had to reconstruct using uh, the, the lips, uh, these two flaps um, uh, brought in from the sides. And of course, we had to uh, shift the upper lip as well, make it a bit, bit smaller. And the mucosa, of course, that is something that is very, very difficult to reconstruct sometimes. So remember this mucosa, although you see it's very ragged due to a dog bite, uh, these are all dog bites, and uh, this, none of the elements are missing. And here, here also the same thing similar that happened, but the muscle is partly intact, but the mucosa was lost. So what needs to be done in these two cases is that the mucosa needs to be separately treated and the skin needs skin and the muscle needs to be separately treated. So mucosa can be advanced across the muscle to cover the defect. Um, it's easier said than done. And uh, and moving on to the filtrum, which is one of the most difficult areas to reconstruct. At the moment, at the moment, we have this flap, which is known as the Abbey flap, which uses the lower lip um, composite tissue turnover and stage procedure. We get a beautiful lip, but the problem is in males where the hair direction is um, upwards, which is it, which needs to be addressed separately. So the re-innovation is another procedure that we do for the uh, mouth where this lady had a, uh, this is not exactly uh, mechanical trauma, but this is actually after surgery. She had uh, a special nerve injury following surgery and uh, we had to use the half of the hypoglossal nerve to re this side. So it took about three months, but um, there's, there's a bit of learning, um, relearning from the patient side, how to use your tongue to smile. So it's, um, it's a tricky question, uh, how to decide which patient gets this, uh, get this surgery. And I would like to uh, 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 end this by saying, reconstruction is evolving, evolving fast. So there are lots and lots of options of free tissue transfers coming up to reconstruct special areas. And we hope that in future, that we get early referrals and uh, a coordinated effort uh, by our general surgical colleagues and other colleagues. So we give them an optimum surgery at optimum time. Thank you. Thank you, Gayan. That was very informative. Uh, have you uh, got any questions? Uh, since uh, we uh, have a few minutes left, we can uh, answer some questions. Uh, I would like to ask uh, any of the speakers actually. Uh, now, the facial uh, trauma is a complex uh, injury from a very simple laceration to very complex uh, major injuries. As I mean, all of you are plastic surgeons. Uh, do you think all this should be managed by plastic surgeons or when do we draw the line? Where, where can we, the others can manage? Anybody wants to take up? Uh, 
I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good question because uh, uh, at the accidents and emergency service at the National Hospital, there are quite a number of uh, facial lacerations. You know, it's, um, uh, if you think that the plastic surgeons can manage everything by themselves, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, but there is an issue with patients. Now the patients, of course, they are requesting the uh, face to be handled by plastic surgeons. That's been a, uh, it's an interest in increasing trend at the moment in, even in National Hospital, the patients don't want anyone else to touch their faces. I, I suppose that will come uh, very, very quickly, uh, way before we even anticipate. I think we should be, while we should, while we are, we should be prepared to handle that wave of referrals. Uh, suddenly, uh, when somebody, everybody wants their face to be sutured by plastic surgeons, at the moment we should uh, give some guide guidance how to um, repair certain um, injuries by general surgical colleagues at the moment. Um, however, there, there is a significant contribution by uh, oral, oral surgeons uh, for the National Hospital. I, I wish to acknowledge them, their, um, their contribution, and it, it has been sustaining the system. And um, at the same time, there is an issue with a legal issue where the, 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 there's a, a surgeon who is uh, suturing because they are manned by, uh, their junior staff is manned by dentists, not by uh, people who are trained in surgery. Uh, they have not done an internship in surgery. They have not um, got a suturing skill, a certified suturing skill. Um, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but I think uh, when, he, when time comes, when a patient uh, sues a dentist for suturing the face in a hospital where there is a plastic surgeon. Uh, the, it's, it's open for debate. Um, I mean, what do you think um, should uh, the other speakers? I mean, it's open for everybody to comment, I suppose. Yes, uh, Gan, I think, uh, as uh, Gan said, like we, we who have the expertise. Uh, can manage the uh, complex and difficult cases, but the uh, initial care and the, some of the simpler uh, injury management, the knowledge can be shared. Like all of all medical students, all junior doctors, SHOs have to be trained in basic surgical skills where they can not, it just have to be the face, even in other areas, uh, how to do a decent skin suturing, less recent suturing and have the correct attitude that uh, this patient has to have a good outcome. Uh, because uh, there's a varied skill level and attitude among the doctors. Uh, so that some people will not take the effort. So sometimes they may not have the skill or the training. So we should all, uh, uh, the plastic surgeons can take a lead here to train the junior doctors to have basic quality of skill level. Like, uh, nobody should be suturing uh, less than acceptable, uh, to get a less than acceptable outcome. But where complex injuries are involved, I think it must go to the experts. Yeah, I think, um it's never going to be possible for plastic surgeons to take over all uh, facial injuries. But so therefore, as I said, if we can train, I think we should train uh, junior surgeons to manage the simpler, straightforward lacerations on the principles of how to manage the skin edge, how, how to do a proper wound toilet and a wound, uh, good washout. And I think we can then train them to therefore get a fairly decent result without um, compromising the patients. But uh, to be also given the confidence to refer as and when necessary so that we can give the guidance. Yes, I think our time is up. So we'll uh, conclude our uh, symposium on facial trauma. Once again, I would like to thank our speakers.
Dr. Arunajit Tamar Singh, Dr. Gayan Ekanak, and Dr. Yasas Abhay Vikrama for their uh, very fruitful contribution. Thank you very much.